Now, there's a saying that says, in Maine, there's a deeply ingrained sense that you can always get a little more use out of something. And that's certainly the case for the protagonist in tonight's story, who returns to Maine after many years away to revisit the cabin of his childhood. Will things go as he plans? We shall wait and see. Now, from time to time, I like to invite you around the campfire to listen to a story accompanied by the sounds of the crackling fire. And guess what? This evening, I have just such a story for you. So, my dear friends, gather around where it's warm and join me with your favorite drink, because it's time to listen. After a six-hour drive, Ted had finally arrived. He had been working and saving for a couple of years for this vacation, and he stepped out of his car with a grin. He was finally home. Not his real home, mind you. His real home was back in South Dakota, here in Maine, just a little north of Sabago Lake, was where he felt most comfortable. He spent many summers here in his childhood. The cabin, which was leased out by his father's landlord, Charlie, was a two-story beauty set in the woods roughly ten minutes away from the sandy shore of the water. Grabbing most of his stuff from the trunk of his car, he walked up to the heavy wooden door. Pushing the key in the hole, he bumped hard into the unmoving portal. The continuous heating and cooling of the old cabin throughout the seasons must have caused the door to stick, so he pushed harder, but it still did not budge. Turning the key back and forth a few times, he finally booted it in hard with a resounding crack. He stepped into the musty living room to see that the door had been barred from the inside. This concerned him. He went through the house, turning lights on, looking for anyone who might be in there. The living room and kitchen were spotless, and the hallways leading to the up and down stairs were undisturbed as well. He opened the door to the basement and pulled the string to the light at the top of the stairs. Nothing. As he got out his phone to turn the flashlight app on, he glanced down into the dark void. A shiver ran down his spine. It looked threatening and sad. The light switched on and he slowly went down the creaking wood steps. Each step was like the base to the solo his heart was giving. Hot sweat beaded down his cool face as he reached the landing. Snap! Something moved and made him nearly jump out of his skin. He reached for the light to the left of the steps and clicked it on painting the concrete walls and earthen floor with light. Ted looked where the noise had come from. On the wall under the stairs was some garden equipment, and a rake had fallen over. Feeling incredibly foolish, yet relieved, he looked around. There was lots of old hunting and trapping gear, which made sense, this being in the middle of nature. On the right side of the basement, where the dirt had not been packed down, was some uninteresting luggage, and to the front, where the stairs came down, was just a washing machine and dryer. Satisfied, he turned off the light and went back upstairs. Reaching the top, he shut the door, letting the rest of his fear run out of him. He checked the bathroom and downstairs bedroom, and found nothing. The top floor was two bedrooms, which were both spotless, and not even that musty. Ted wasn't one to dwell on things, so he just left it to the owner being an eccentric. Feeling hungry, he went back down to his car. The cooler in the back seat had a six-pack of PBR, a personal favourite from his teen years, and some stuff for sandwiches. Closing the door, he took a moment to admire the land as the sun began to set. The trees in the surrounding woods were bright orange, with a contrasting darkness, both blending together to make everything look like it was on fire. Thinking back to his childhood here, he remembered his dad dropping the first pile of logs into the fire pit to the south of the cabin. With a clunk, he'd stand up straight, put his hand on Ted and proclaim, Ah, this is the magic hour. 
Anything can happen, from elves visiting from the trees to the spirits of the Seiko River coming to enact the curse. You'd say that with a chuckle. Ted always felt spooky excitement run through him the rest of the night, and the years hadn't taken that from him. He sighed with exhilaration and went back inside. He walked into the kitchen, cooler in hand, and stopped. The fridge and all of the cupboards were open, and then the smell hit him. It was like rotting flesh, and he almost threw up. Moving towards the fridge, he saw the shelves had old food on them. How old it was, or even what it had been, he didn't know. Wait, were all the doors open when he walked in before? Sure he would have noticed, at least that horrid stench. He grabbed some garbage bags from under the sink and began to dump the fridge's contents. He couldn't believe the old man would just leave this stuff here for so long, but he had to be pushing 70 now and probably didn't give a rat's ass. After about 20 minutes of cleaning the fridge, the smell died down and he could finally stomach a sandwich. He made his favourite, triple roast beef and cheese, and sat down on the couch to listen to the radio. Opening a beer, he flipped it on, hearing nothing but static. He tuned past a few scratchy country stations and finally found one with classic rock. ACDC's Back in Black was playing when he downed his beer in two and then got up for another one. Coming back to the living room, the station had cut out. It was nothing but static at first, but then he could clearly hear a girl's voice. She sounded like she was crying, or pleading, and he made out the words, I'm so hungry. Then the static cut back in again, and the song Bad to the Bone by George Thorogood took its place. Ted was beginning to get nervous. He ultimately chalked it up to a strange coincidence, but with the sun barely visible now, and being by himself, his imagination was starting to get to him. He took a deep breath and a deep swig and went through his bags to get the Sudoku he did when he had free time. He rifled through it but realized it was in his passenger seat. He got up and opened the door and his heart leapt from his chest as he rushed back behind the door. In his front seat was a silhouette just staring at him. He didn't get a great look but it was definitely a woman with dark hair. He looked next to the wood stove and grabbed a small metal shovel on its wooden holder. Slowly opening the front door, he looked again to see an empty car. He knew that there was someone in there just a second ago. He wasn't sure what was going on, but he didn't feel comfortable here anymore. He packed his belongings into his bags And, with a careful glance, he went out to his car. He put his stuff in the back seat and got in to start it. Only, his fingers didn't meet his keys. He looked over, and sure enough, they were not in the ignition. Fuck, he yelled in frustration. Now he would have to get a hold of the police and report it. Gee, some vacation. He pulled the phone out of his pocket and went to dial the number for the local police when he noticed the smell. It smelled exactly like that rancid food he'd thrown away. Through the sounds of his own gagging, he heard something else from behind him. A funny sort of crackling noise, like that of a fistful of grass being pulled from the ground. He looked in his rearview mirror and saw something that made his skin crawl. It was the woman again. Her dark hair about shoulder length glistened with something moist. One of her eyes hung limply from her dark, bloody socket. Chunks of meat were missing from her face, and where her jaw should have been, a gaping hole ripped from her cheeks down her neck, 
and her tongue flapped nauseatingly as if she were trying to speak. He let out a scream he never recognized before. In a flurry of motion, he opened the door, ran back inside, and slammed the door shut. The whole thing felt like somebody was moving his body for him, and he was watching it all unfold from outside of himself. Slowly, he slumped to the ground against the door. His breathing erratic, and his hands around his knees. As he felt like he was slowly gaining control again, his entire body erupted in shakes. He began to get a hold of himself and started to stand up. The radio was playing something by Aerosmith, and he went over to the couch. Ted pulled out his cell phone to call the police, but noticed it was out of service. Figures, he said, as he set it on the end table. He got up and locked the door, putting a chair against the knob for good measure. He made sure all the windows were shut and locked, and went upstairs to his old bedroom. He wasn't going to go to sleep, not after that, but being locked in the room upstairs made him feel a lot better about the whole thing. He kept the light on as he got into bed. There was another radio up here, and he tuned it into a nightly talk show. They were talking about football. Not that he cared what the subject was. The voices just made him feel a hell of a lot better. After a while of his mind still racing, he began to grow bored, which turned into curiosity. His instincts knew better, but he looked out of the window into the darkness anyway. The moon didn't provide a lot of light, and he had to squint for a few minutes. The trees swayed gently back and forth, and his car was empty. He saw nothing in the still night, and this made him feel better. Maybe the whole thing was just nonsense. He still couldn't talk himself out of what he'd seen, but it had been quiet for a while. Maybe he was just... <gasps> he trailed off in his mind as he saw a figure emerge from the woods. It was slim, and when it walked, it was in a jerking motion, like it had no feet, and it just gazed up at him. Ted reared away from the window and thought briefly about going down to get something as a weapon, but there was no way in hell he was going to leave this room. He was just going to sit up here and wait for the morning, and then run to the nearest house. He was going to... He thought, as the power went out. His pulse raced as the dark and quiet set in, almost as perfect as the woods during the magic hour. He swallowed dryly in his throat as he listened for anything coming from downstairs or outside. Tick, 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 he heard. The sound of something dripping coming from the bathroom to the left of the room he was in, and the door was slightly open. He turned on his flashlight and slowly turned to it. He opened the door all the way, and the light revealed the tub. The shower curtain was closed. He could hear the steady ticking coming from it. He moved forward to push the curtain aside, then thought better of it, and pulled away, as the curtain ripped open from the other side. There was an old, fat man in the full tub of water, looking at Ted with hatred. That was when Ted recognized him as the landlord, Charlie. The swollen body rose out of the water, and moved in an unnatural way towards him, falling as he reached a large leg over the edge of the tub. Ted backed out of there and out of the bedroom to the downstairs. He grabbed a fire poker and sat on the couch shivering, just waiting for the waterlogged corpse to come down after him. Nothing came. He crept back up the stairs, moving slowly, ready to bash it in with his iron weapon. At the top, he looked into the bedroom. 
There was nothing, but he still heard the tick, tick, tick coming from the bathroom. Slowly, he moved to open the door. Water flooded the ground, but the curtain was shut. He moved the tip of the fabric, swung it open to reveal nothing. There was no body, or even any water. The faucet was just open enough to allow a stream of droplets to tap the drain. He made his way back downstairs to the couch. I'm going crazy, he thought. I'm losing my mind. He gently rocked himself back and forth when he heard the door creak open. Suddenly, he remembered he'd left the back door unlocked. He jerked his head down the hall and saw the dark shape of the woman. He could hear her joints crackle with every move she made, and she made a disturbing noise from the hole in her neck, her flailing tongue punctuating every noise with a moist smack. Every step let out a sickening thud from her feetless legs, and she was coming closer. Panicked, he turned to run out of the front door, only to find it blocked by the former landlord. With an angry sneer, he charged at Ted. Ted stabbed the poker into his stomach with a wet squelch, and, like a hole in a barrel, dark water began pouring out. Ted's ways out were blocked, so he ran to the basement stairs, locking the door behind him. Quickly, he made his way to the bottom and turned on the light. He was now royally screwed and weaponless. He went over to the hunting equipment. Most of it was just basic supplies, nothing of any real use. But now he noticed the rust color on the bear traps was also on the earthen floor. The wavy patterns looked like it made its way back to the darker part of the ground. He followed it. And as he bent down, that's when he heard a creak from the other side of the room. His head moved over to the lower outside window from the back. It was open, and pushing through it was the jawless woman. She crawled through and fell limply to the floor, unmoving for a moment. Then, in a grotesque display of rigor mortis consumed limbs, she stood up and started walking over to him. He had nowhere to go. Above, he could hear Charlie slamming against the door, demanding entrance. Slowly, the horror set in as she was now only five feet away. Her hands came up, and he closed his eyes, letting out a whimper, knowing that this was the end. Cold, stiff hands made their way on either side of his face, and he saw a vision in his head. A woman was being held in the basement. She tried to run, so someone broke her ankles using bear traps, and then cut them off with a saw when they became infected. Then the scene changed to her begging for food. She hadn't eaten in a while, and was looking gaunt. A man was tired of hearing this, so he ripped her jaw right from her, killing her. That man was Charlie. Suddenly, he snapped back to reality, and the woman was nowhere to be seen. Banging could still be heard from above, and he looked down at the uneven earth. Grabbing a shovel, he began to dig. The banging became even more desperate, as, only about a foot down, he saw the decaying face of the woman. All at once, the banging stopped. He finally lost his supper from this smell, and went hesitantly to the top. Charlie was nowhere to be seen. All was quiet. He ran to the front door and threw it open. The cold, fresh air felt amazing, and as he reached into his pocket for his phone, he found his keys. Not thinking twice, he got into his car and drove away. The next day, police and a crime scene unit were all over the property. 
They determined that Charlie had kidnapped a young woman named Carol Burns. He kept her down there as a sex slave. And, eventually, when he got bored of her, he found new, interesting ways to torture her, eventually killing her. They weren't sure how Charlie's body had made its way into the well in the back of the house. So, it was labelled a suicide. Ted wasn't found guilty of anything, other than being a loony to most of the officers he talked to. They marked the case closed, and all loose ends had been tied. All except the small, round, bloody marks leading from the back door to the basement. Well, as you can probably hear from my voice, I'm still a little bit under the weather, and it's made my voice even deeper than it is normally, so I <laughs> hope it's not too painful to listen to. But I could only just about manage a 20-minute story for you today. Uh, I can't read much longer than that at the moment. But, of course, I will keep the videos coming thick and fast. So, make sure you join me again soon. I'll be back with you next Monday. And I know you're going to join me, of course you are. All those of you working over the weekend, take it easy, don't work too hard. And of course, I hope you've got this story to keep you coming if you're working on your own or during the night shift. Well, my friends, see you all again soon. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it, if you like, on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>